Good evening. We'd like to welcome you to the United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. Tonight, you're going to be listening to Lonnie Bunis. Uh, Lonnie works at the Raritan Valley Community College. He's been an amateur astronomer since the age of nine. Um, he is a international space artist. Um, and he's going to be talking about what's up in the August sky. This is his first time live back at Jenny Jump in 10 months. And we are very happy to be able to present live again. So thank you all for coming up. And without further ado, may I introduce my husband, Lonnie Bunis. Thank you, Jim. Oh, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be back. And I, I see a lot of new faces. I see smiling faces, but of course, I'm just imagining that because I can't see your mouth. But that's OK. I'm glad we're all safe. Um, tonight, I've been told that at 8.38, the International Space Station will fly overhead. But the problem is, it's bright, right? Because in the summer, it takes a bit longer for things to get done. So uh, you're going to want to try that again. And online, you can find references to when the ISS, the International Space Station, flies overhead. It's not every time, not every night. Um, what's up in the August sky when it's clear, when it's not cloudy? I want you to encourage all of you to do this at home. Kids, you know how they say kids do this at home? Even if it's cloudier and we can't see much tonight, I'm going to show you what you can see throughout all of August. And we're going to want to come back and see what's up in the September sky and the October sky and even beyond that because since the Earth is moving around the sun, the sky keeps changing. There's always something new to see. So let's start with August. Uh, we're looking at a really nice picture of a nebula where stars are forming. And we're going to see where that is a little bit later. If you have questions at the end, I'll be very happy to take them. Uh, first of all, I just want to bring up our, our quick guide that we always show our visitors before and after a program. There's a, a lot of things you can do here besides looking up at the sky, and we encourage you to do that. Ask a lot of questions of our amateur astronomers. Visit our gift shop when, when it's open and uh, so forth and so on. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, lots to do. I'll bring that up again later. Let's start with, did anybody hear about this? The comet? Hear about the comet? Anyone? Anyone? Lots of people. Has anybody seen the comet? Yeah, well, oh, you guys are lucky because I haven't yet. It's an embarrassment. I'm an amateur astronomer for some 50 years, and I haven't seen this new comet Neowise, N-E-O-W-I-S-E. -E. Here's its orbit. It went past the sun very close, very fast, crossing the orbit of Earth, the third major planet from the sun, right? And here we are, only uh, some very close distance, 80 or 90 million miles away from the comet. That's relatively close, in, according to astronomers because we measure everything by the distance between the Sun and the Earth. One astronomical unit, A period, U period. That's about 93 million miles. So you can see the comet is relatively close as we measure things in the solar system. Not as you would go to work commuting 20 or 30 or 40 miles. That's a little different. Comet Neowise was discovered with the help of the WISE -E, spacecraft, Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. Right? This is a NASA space telescope orbiting up around the Earth, launched in 2009. Uh, they put it to sleep in 2011. They brought it back in 2013 for more data. And it's discovered lots of stuff, lots of minor planets, a Y-type star, which is a very uh, dim, very, uh, let's just say, not too warm brown dwarf star, about the same temperature as you, body temperature. It's extraordinarily cool for a star. It's a long period comet. Uh, don't worry, if it, uh, some of you have missed the comet, it will be back. 
in 6,800 years, which, you know, by astronomical means, that's rather short, right? Astronomers think that one to 10 million years in the history of a planet like Mars, that's short. That's astronomers for you. They've got the, the long-term picture. So this is one of the brightest comets visible in recent time. I was around, I know, I know I'm, I'm ancient. I saw a comet hail bop, my wife is nodding. I saw a comet hail bop in 1997. That was a long time ago. Some of you weren't even born then. I was uh, only two at the time. Uh, but it was a very bright naked eye comet, that's rare. We see two tails coming off the comet in this close-up picture, not taken by amateur instruments. There's a tail that's curved, that's the same color as the sun. It's dust reflecting sunlight, going backwards in a curved path following the orbit of the comet, and then much faster, pushed by the pressure of sunlight. Yep, did you know light has pressure? Can you feel it? You don't have to believe everything I say. Uh, but sunlight does have a very mild pressure that pushes ionized gases coming off of the comet straight back in a beautiful bluish color. The ion tail, the dust tail. Comets have two tails. If you want to see the comet, you want to look in the northwest. Northwest. The Jenny Jump, when you face away from the observatory that way, towards the racetrack, Yes, we have a racetrack, it's loud, it's bright, and it shuts down late at night. That way is south. So where does the sun set if I'm facing south? What direction is that? Uh, audience participation West. is not punished. What is it? West. West, West right? That way is east. As the Earth re ro rotates, Everything seems to move across the sky east to west. So we're going to start seeing what's up in the sky with the west when I begin in a few moments. If you want to see the comet, look for the Big Dipper in the northwest, low in the sky. Here's its position over the past few days in July. Here it is tonight on the 1st. Look for the Big Dipper and find the feet, the claws of the great bear, Ursa Major. Front claws, back claws, tail makes the bend in the handle of the big bit. So that's where you're going to look for the comet. I don't know about you, that's where I'm going to look for the comet, because I'm embarrassed to admit, as an amateur astronomer, I haven't even seen it yet. But it is visible to the eye, you know where to look. So tonight, let's find out what's up in the sky. Uh, what I'm about to show you has been approved for all audiences. There's no need to cover the eyes of the younger members of the audience. It's perfectly safe. If you'd like to find out for yourselves, I see a lot of people using cell phones and tablets, go to csky.org for organization. csky, S-E-A-S-K-Y dot org. And you can look for the calendar of events by using my link. But even if you forget, it's easy to find. Explore the sky, not the sea. Click on that. Find the astronomy reference guide. It's a second thing down. Click on that. Look over on the left of the astronomical calendar. What's up? It's not a calendar. Grasshopper. We've got alien life. And then you've got your choice of years. You can go back in time. You could go forward in time. You could click on, what's the current year? 2020, thank you. We have some bolder members of the audience. You will be rewarded. You'll be allowed to leave later, the rest. And here's what's up. Here's what's coming up. We've got a full moon, lots of events, everybody taking notes. Good. Any questions? OK, thank you for coming. You've been a great audience. That's it for. All right, I know you, I can see panic. Some of you are panicking. Is it that short, really? No, there isn't. It. Well, let's look at things one at a time. Let's slow down a bit. I don't want to step on the alien life that just blew up. There it is. See it? We have a full moon. Why is that bad? The 
full moon is round and bright. Yeah, it interferes with seeing faint stuff at night, just like all this does. That clouds, like full moon's light gets in the way, even if there were no clouds. The uh, full moon, it, did you know the full moon goes by different names for all the different months? Very cool. Uh, it's called the sturgeon moon. That's when the sturgeon fish tend to spawn. Right? The early natives, the Ameri Native Americans, the American Indians, called it the sturgeon moon. Also corn moon, green corn moon, and grain moon. Right? If you want to find out exactly when, when is the full moon exact? Well, there's a specific time, 15 hours and 59 minutes universal time. The time in London is the universal time that astronomers measure things across the world because we all live in different time zones. But astronomers have to coordinate and know exactly when something happened. If you want to convert from universal time, subtract four hours. We rise in the morning as the Earth turns into sunlight earlier than London, right? Four hours earlier. What's 15 minus four? Mathematicians in the audience? Nobody's pulling out a cell phone? Does your cell phone have a, like mine, have a calculator on it? What's 15 minus 4? Quick! 11! Yes, 11.59 in the morning. That's when the moon turned, turned and will turn exactly full on August 3rd. What other stuff is happening? Um, why is the, the moon full? Why is this the worst time to look to see features on the moon? The moon has craters and mountains that you can see even in a small telescope. Did you know that? You can bring your own telescope to Jenny Jump. We, we are amateur astronomers would like to help you learn how to set it up and use it. So if you're going to look through a telescope tonight that belongs to someone else, that's great. But you can bring your own binoculars. You can bring your own telescope. You can bring this. <laughs> right? We have a technical term for it. Yep. What is that? Thank you, the naked eye. I see some of you have been here before. We have uh, some experts in the audience. So if you have any questions, ask them. Uh, the Earth, Moon, and Sun line up. When the Moon is full, it's opposite the Sun. Fully lit up. Worst time to look at it. I used a program, a free computer program, called Celestia to, to make that picture. You can zoom out. Look at anywhere in the solar system. Look at the planet Saturn from one of its moons. You could see an eclipse of the sun by the Earth from the moon in Celestia. Really cool stuff. You can run it on your phone. Go to celestia.space. We'll take a look at that later if there's time. But uh, I know a lot of you have heard about meteors. Right? You know what a meteor is? The rock from space comes through the atmosphere, and then we call it by a different name when it hits the ground. There's an awful lot of shy people in the audience. After that, I got to tell you, I was shy when I was younger. Yeah, somebody said meteorite is correct, like a mineral name, right? Like lignite, right? Pyrite, fool's gold. Meteorite is when it hits the ground. Well, if you want to see meteors streaking through the sky, this is one of the two best times of the year. One time is Christmas, the Geminids from Gemini. This year, right now, this time of year, the Perseids come from the constellation Perseus. Up to 60 an hour. In dark skies, like we have here when there's no clouds, you might see that many. You might see a bright one every few minutes. Where I live, where there are trees and lights, probably a lot like where a lot of you live, you might be lucky to see just one or two meteors in an hour. But it's worth trying. It's really fun. I'm going to show you how to do that a little bit later. I want to draw your attention to the fact that the peak of the shower <coughs> has a peak when it's stronger, and that's the night of the 11th and 12th. Every year, it's mid-August, as the Earth enters the track of an old comet that's broken up and left what we scientists like to call by the scientific term debris, dirt, leftover stuff 
as a comet breaks up, it leaves dust and gas and debris. It's the comet Swift Tuttle that still exists, that still orbits the sun, and we go through its track every year. It takes a while for that to happen, from July 17th to August 24th this year. So for those of you who missed the 11th and 12th, don't panic. Go out every night when it's dark. Midnight's the best, but if you can't stay up that late, that's all right. Look when it's dark. Other stuff happening. August 13th, after the meteor shower, Venus is, is its greatest distance west of the sun. Now let's think about this. West of the sun. If the sun is straight down there in the sky, and that's where you would find it at any time. West is that way, to the right. So, if the sun sets and Venus is west, can we see it? It's underground. It's on the other side of the world. Gotta wait till the sun comes up in the morning. Rabbit. Grasshopper, rabbit, what's next? You gotta wait till the sun rises in the morning. And Venus is west of the sun, up high, about 46 degrees. It's a great time to see the morning star. Have you ever heard the planet Venus referred to as the morning star, the evening star? Because it's the second planet from the sun and orbits close, it can be seen in our skies either left or right of the sun. Right of the sun in the morning, left of the sun in the evening. Great time to see the brightest planet. New moon on August 19th. New moon means close to the sun. It's not lit up very much at all. We can't even see it. That's a great time to see deep sky objects, faint objects in the sky. And then, Along comes September, when the moon is full again, September 2nd. But I'll be talking about that again in my next talk, which I do the first Saturday of each month. You'll never guess what the next one is called. What's up in the... September. September. Brilliant! <laughs> the September sky, yep. So that's when I'll be talking about sky events for September. Now, there's some very neat things that are happening down uh, at night after the sun sets, when the full moon is coming up, like, like tonight, very close to full. The moon passes through certain constellations, star pictures that we make out of stars. Right? There's a lot of constellations up there. One of them is called Lepus, the rabbit. So we have a, a guest appearance by Lepus right there. No constellation I know is called the grass. Through these signs of the zodiac, have you heard of those? Certain signs that the moon passes through and the sun and the planets Jupiter and Saturn that are visible tonight down in the south. I'll have to take that back. We see clouds coming in, so you may not see them tonight. But we urge you to come back. Try it again. Through these signs, there's a lot of cool stuff to see at night, so do look down in the south. But the problem with doing it the old way and looking at still pictures like this, what's the problem with this? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, it's boring. You know, nowadays, we've got computer programs that let us simulate the sky. So that's what I'm going to do with a free program, Stellarium. Go to stellarium.org. You can download it. You can see it on your phone. You can run it on a laptop or a desktop. And that's what I'm going to do right now. We can see the sky as it appears on Earth anywhere in the past, present, or future. We can zoom in. We can zoom out. We can cheat a little bit because, you know, when you go outside and look for the giant letter S down there, you're going to see it. Anyone? No. Unless you're hallucinating, you won't see a red letter S to help you. You want to look down where the planets are in the moon tonight. Right? You can zoom in to see details like this. To see the full disk of the moon, we had to zoom in quite a bit, didn't we? Now, this is the problem with star charts. They are small. They make everything compressed, and they distort things a little bit. But they are a good way to learn. And that's how I learn the sky, by using a star chart 
and a technique that I'm going to show you called star hopping. Star hopping. I'm going to use stellarium like a star chart. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to start where the stars are setting. Where is everything setting? What direction is that? A lot, lot of shy people in the audience. Can you say it louder? Yeah. West. Thank you very much. West. If you want to see what's disappearing first, look in the west. Look for, well, you know, we can cheat a little bit. We can bring up the names. And we can draw lines between the stars and see Virgo, Buotes, or Buertes. By following a famous group of stars in the north, the Big Dipper, and using its handle to arc to a bright star, Arcturus. Fourth brightest star in the night sky, an orange colored star. Is it orange in Stellarium? Sadly, no. No color. But the human eye can see colors in the sky. We can tell the temperatures of stars just with this piece of equipment that we were born with. Yep, the naked eye can do a lot. That's why I urge all of you, when I finish talking, apply this knowledge, come back, learn some more. But when you're home, do it at home. It's fun. I just see the, uh, the moon is out. The gibbous moon just came out of the cloud. So look in the west to see the stars of west that are disappearing. I like to, uh, like to make everybody dizzy, go back to the north, and start by orienting ourselves with the famous Big Dipper. See it? The Big Dipper is not one of the officially recognized constellations. Did you know that? A little bit of trivia. It's a part, a piece, of the Great Bear, Ursa Major. It's officially called an asterism, asterism, or star picture. And you can see seven stars in the Big Dipper, unless you have really good eyesight, look in the bend of the handle, and you might see uh, an extra star. Look at that, eight stars in the Big Dipper. Did you know? There's a famous double star in the handle of the Big Dipper. Most stars in the universe, in our galaxy, come in groups. There's not a whole lot of single stars, but there are many binaries and multiple star systems. This is a visible, visual binary star. Famous, Mizar and Alpha. There's also another bear. Can you find it? Follow the pointers. Five times their distance apart. One, two, three, four, five. And you'll just miss. If you're a straight line, you'll just miss Polaris, pole star. It has another name. Anybody know it? North Star, correct. Thank you. You guys win. You guys can leave at the end. I promise there's no, no captive audience. You can leave any time. But I'm going to ask you to stick around and see what's up in the August star. Big Dipper, Little Dipper. Find the letter W and the house-shaped group of stars. These are supposed to be a king and queen. Cassiopeia, Cepheus. Cassiopeia is famous for being part of a story that's been in the library for 3,000 years. So if you haven't read it, you have no excuse. If you didn't see the movie Clash of the Titans, you have no excuse. If you didn't see the new version of Clash of the Titans, no excuse. The story of Perseus and Andromeda begins with the Queen Cassiopeia, who boasted that her daughter Andromeda was more beautiful than any of the Greek goddesses. This was a big mistake, very big. If you know the Greek goddesses, you know they were very jealous. Big mistake. It began the story of Perseus and Andromeda. And all of those characters I mentioned are up in the sky, all of them. In fact, Perseus is where we get the name of the meteor shower that features this month. So now you know five groups of stars, five constellations in the north that never rise or set. They just spin around and around the North Pole star, always visible. They're up even in the daytime. But there is a star that gets in the way, and that star is the 
the sun, nearest star to the earth. The, the really coolest stuff to see this August is in the south. So I'm going to spin around to the south, and I'm going to start low and work my way up. Now, you know what? Let's start high up because our necks get tired, right? And then we'll work our way down. So look up high in the sky for that bright star Arcturus that we saw before. So the herdsman doesn't look anything like a herdsman to me. Looks kind of like a, what do you think? A kite? Right, one of, one of the uh, students in one of my classes called it the rocket ship with the iron flame. Next to it, Corona Borealis, the northern crown. Next to that, a giant letter H, famous hero, a giant letter H. Audience participation, again, is not punished. Hercules, you've heard of Hercules, right? All right, who hasn't heard of Hercules? Who has not heard of That's what I thought. Hercules is a great constellation to use to find a deep sky object. That's an object far away from us that's not a star. It could be a gas cloud. It could be a cluster of stars. It's famous right here. Can you see it? No, you can't. You need a pair of binoculars. Let's see, can we zoom in a little? Can you see anything over there yet? In the keystone of Hercules, shaped like the keystone in an arch, architectural keystone, look a third of the way down from the top right star for a fuzzy blob. Let's zoom in a little bit. We amateur astronomers like to call it, by the technical term, the fuzzy blob. See it yet? Zooming in. A little bit more. Looks like a little cloud. In a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, this is a small cloud. It's known as M13, M as in Messier, a French astronomer who collected a bunch of things that were really annoying to him. Messier was looking <coughs> over 100 years ago for comets, and comets are fuzzy. But Messier noticed hundreds of other objects, well, dozens of other objects that were fuzzy that got in the way that were not comets. How did he know? Because what do comets do that other things don't? They do what planets do. They move over time. If you look in the north on any clear night for the comet Neowise, you're going to notice night after night that it changes its position. It's moving very fast. Messier made a list of stuff that annoyed him that got in the way, like M13, number 13 in his catalog, a giant cluster of stars in a globe shape, a round shape like a globe. Astronomers have a name for these kinds of collections of stars. Take a wild guess. Yeah. Uh, not a galaxy, getting close. Mm -hmm. It's a cluster of stars in the shape of a globe. Globular cluster is correct. You win. What does this gentleman win? You can go home. But not yet. Thank you. This globular cluster is the most easily seen from New Jersey. There is a brighter one very low in the sky, Omega Centauri, in the Centaur, but the Centaur is a southern constellation. So any of you lucky enough to travel to South America or below the equator, you might see Omega Centauri. In a small telescope, looks like a fuzzy ball. In large telescopes, hundreds of stars. There are actually 500,000 stars in this cluster. It is one of many thousands of globular clusters that orbit our Milky Way at every angle, all kinds of directions. The Milky Way itself is pretty flat. The stars follow a flat pancake, but the globular clusters do this. This one's fairly close to us. We sent a signal to it in um, the 1970s, and the signal's going to take only about 30,000 years to get there, and an answer will come back in another 30,000 years. So stick around. M13, 
Well, you know, Messier threw out all these uh, M objects that we now have a catalog for, but it's like my mother always said, never throw anything away. Might come in handy. Down below Hercules, if you look lower in the sky, you will see the 13th sign of the zodiac. The what? I see, I see looks of incredulity. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you're astonished. Even through your mask, you look really surprised. I can see it. It's getting dark, but I've got pretty good eyes. Uh, you're astonished because how many signs of the zodiac are there really? Well, right. Well, when astrology got started, the Earth was pointing in a certain direction, but the Earth is like a top. As it spins, it slowly wobbles. Can you feel it? No, 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 no. Can you feel the Earth turning once a day? Too slow, you can't feel that. It takes almost 25,000 years for the Earth to wobble in a circle once, right? So right now, our wobble points us at the North Star, but in about 10,000 years, the bright star Vega is going to be our pole star. And so, as we say in the scientific terminology, things go off. Constellations go out of alignment. We have the sun, moon, and planets moving through part of Ophiuchus, the serpent carrier. See the head of the serpent? See the tail of the serpent? And the guy carrying the serpent? You do need some good imagination. And I can cheat a little bit and show you a picture. Ophiuchus, the serpent carrier. Right below Ophiuchus, famous constellation, Scorpius. What is that? Scorpius. Zodiac sign Scorpio. Nobody knows what that is? Sounds like it. Scorpion, correct. With the bright red star. Antares, the rival of Mars. Every so often, Mars will pass right by the star. Mars doesn't twinkle, and Antares twinkles. That's how you tell a planet from the star. Right? Planets are bright enough that they send a lot of light to our eye, more than a star. They don't twinkle. Not usually. Right next to the Scorpion, a group of stars that's supposed to be a centaur, Half man, half horse, holding a bow and arrow. Sagittarius, the arrow too. But I don't see that. I see uh, this. Something you might find in a kitchen. Something that helps you make coffee or tea. Teapot, correct. That is what amateur astronomers call the teapot. Very good. If you look at the spout of the teapot and look above it, when the night is dark, you'll see steam coming out of the teapot. At Jenny Jump, at UACNJ Observatory, it starts there, and over the summer, it crosses the entire sky. It is the Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy of one trillion stars that we live in. Our star is one star out of a thousand billion. That's a million, million stars. That's one followed by 12 zeros. When I was growing up, they thought there were 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. We now know because of the faint stars that were discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope, about a trillion stars, a thousand billion. The center of the Milky Way lies right there above the teapot. In it, in the center of our galaxy, there is, have you heard about this? A giant black hole more than a million times the mass of our sun, sucking down gas and dust and stars and anything that gets too close. Are we in danger? Are we in danger from the black hole? Anybody? Nope. Very far away. Just farther than the globular cluster. But you might see some faint steam rising up, crossing the whole sky. It's a little hard to see in Stellarium, especially on our screen. I encourage you to try it at home for yourself. Or come here and look for the Milky Way. Right down low, in this area of the sky, there are beautiful nebulas, gas clouds. There is one that you can see with the unaided eye. 
There it is. And in close up, it's got a black lane of dust moving down the middle, just like a, a lagoon, like a river. This is called the Lagoon Nebula, and it's a beautiful place where stars are being born. How do we know? Because some old guys like me, some astronomers, have been watching them go on for decades. They can actually see dust collapsing, slowly forming newborn stars. It's beautiful. It's like watching the hands of a clock. Boring, but rewarding to see a star being born. One year, here at Jenny Jump, I looked right down there at the Milky Way, the sky was dark, and I saw this little fuzzy cloud, and I thought, what is that? I got a pair of binoculars. I was astonished to see that it was the Lagoon Nebula that I could see with this. What's this? The what? Naked eye. eye. Thank you. You all have them. Use them. Tonight, look down low in the sky to the left of the teapot. You'll see a bright object getting in the way, shining a lot of light. It's called the moon. And it was up just a little few moments ago. Right next to it, in opposition to Earth, that means Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, all on the same side of the sun in their orbit. They are as close to us as they can get, which is still pretty far. The Earth is 1 AU from the sun. Jupiter 5, Saturn almost 10. Right, but 5 minus 1 is 4. Jupiter is 4 AU away. 10 minus 1 is 9. Saturn's 9 AU. Each AU takes 8 and a third minutes. Jupiter is about half hour away by light. Saturn like an hour. Takes that long for the signal to get to us. So we are seeing the planets Jupiter and Saturn as they appeared in the past. When you look at the sky further and further back, further away from us, you're looking further and further back in time. It takes light that long to get to us from deep sky objects. The planets are among the closest. So, lots of stuff to see. I'm going to leave you with the most embarrassing constellation in the sky the most embarrassing constellation in the sky. Looks to me like a bikini bottom or a bikini top. It's actually called the Sea Goat Capricornus. And it's embarrassing because uh, it's my sign. It's supposedly the sign under which I was born, where the sun was when I was born. The only problem is because astrology is off by one whole sign, since the Earth has wobbled in the past 3,000 years. Where I was actually born when the sun, when, where was the sun when I was born? It was over here in the next constellation. So astrology is off by an entire sign. Don't tell astrologers, you don't want to make them cry. So that is Stellarium. Great program, you can use it, you can get it, it's free. And it's fun. So, before we all go home, I've got some news. <coughs> well, we're not going to go home right away. We're going to look up at a beautiful cloud filled sky. So, I apologize for Mother Nature. I am going to urge you to come back any night that we're open, free to the public, any Saturday. I'm not the only person who gives talks. There are other topics like black holes, newly discovered planets. Uh, space telescopes, gravity telescopes that have discovered black holes crashing together. Very exciting topic. This is one of the first pictures of planets orbiting other stars. When I was growing up, nobody knew what any moon looked like except our moon. No one knew what an asteroid looked like. No one knew, knew if there were other planets around other stars or what they looked like. These are actual pictures of giant planets orbiting another star. They were taken by the, I know this is very difficult to remember, scientific name, Very Large Telescope, VLT. Very Large Telescope. It's a set of telescopes that simulate a giant aperture miles across. 
This is the star TY8998760-1. Everybody, repeat after me. TY... No, that's okay. This is a very young star, according to Alexander Bond, one of the uh, astronomers who studied it. A very young star. Our star is about 5,000 million years old. That's 5 billion with a B. 5 billion years old. Sun, don't worry, don't worry. I know some of you are worried. The sun's got another 5 billion years to go before it expands and engulfs the inner planet. But uh, we probably won't be around, not to worry. This is a young star, 17 million years old. It has two giant planets, much bigger, much heavier than, than Jupiter, much further away than Jupiter from the sun. Jupiter is five astronomical units. These planets are hundreds of astronomical units away. Our farthest giant planet, Neptune, 30 times your sun distance. 30 a year. So you can see these are very far away. They were discovered with the spectral polarimetric high conscious exoplanet research. Everybody repeat after me. The spectral polarimetric. Uh, just a sphere. S P A T R E instrument that blocked the light of the star, making it possible to actually see planets for the first time orbiting another star than the sun. You can find these stars in the constellation Musca. Musca was named by astronomers in the southern hemisphere. It originally meant the bee, but now it means the fly. Musca the fly. We cannot see the fly from New Jersey. It's a southerly constellation near the Southern Cross. Has anybody here ever traveled south of the equator, maybe on board a ship or by plane? Anyone? Maybe you saw some, yeah, yeah, if you do that, again, look for the Southern Cross. It shows where the South Pole of the Earth points in the sky. We are in the Northern Hemisphere are lucky to have a North Star. All right, now the star attraction of summer, August, the Perseid meteor shower. How do we see it? Well, I've got to warn you, you need some very expensive equipment. I know some of you are disappointed. This is it. You need a nice, comfortable chair. You need to sit down in the chair, use your naked eye, and lay in back and look at as much of the sky as you can at once. Because the eye is the best instrument. Not binoculars, not a telescope, because the meteors shoot out in all different directions from one place in the sky, from Perseus the hero, coming up in the northeast late at night below the horizon. If you wait till after midnight, Perseus will rise and you can find him. I can point him out in the future what's up in the sky talk. The meteors shoot out in different directions, but they really are on a parallel track, just like railroad tracks. Do railroad tracks ever touch? They're parallel. So when you look at them going into the distance, they seem to go together, but in reality, they never do. It's just like the uh, lanes of a highway. The lines never meet, but they look like they meet in the distance. The meteors come from one place, but stretch out through the sky in a parallel track that we pass through, dust and debris. So to get started in astronomy, what do you want to do? You, wanna, you can uh, invest in a pair of binoculars, which are good because what happens if you get bored using the binoculars for astronomy? You can go to the racetrack. You can do a lot of things. You can look at birds. You can spy on your neighbors. Don't, not that I recommend that. You can watch things that are, that are a great distance very comfortably because binoculars turn lenses, images that are upside down, back right side up. Right? If you hold the magnifying glass, everything is upside down. Same thing in an astronomical telescope. You can find a nice article at skyandtelescope.com about how to get started with binoculars. You can also learn from the same source, skyandtelescope.com, a great article about getting your first telescope. Right? It doesn't have to be fancy. 
Uh, you can get a decent telescope now for under $200. It does sound expensive, but actually it needs to be a lot more. But what's the best way? Make it, I don't hear everybody. Thank you, make it eye. You've got it, use it. If you want to see what's up in the sky, you could come here, you can go out. If you want to see what's not up in the sky, like Drano, the constellation Android, the constellation Conus Major, the ice cream cone in the summer, you can get the book Science Made Stupid, one of my favorite books. It's long out of print, but it's all available free online. Look for Science Made Stupid by Tom Weller, uh, absolute genius. He wrote the whole book himself. He illustrated the whole book himself. And it's so funny that I hurt myself laughing. Check it out. Now, you didn't think you were getting away without a little test, did you? A little recap. I saw a lot of people taking notes furiously on their smartphones and stylus. You know, you got your uh, tablets out. No, no. What am I going to do with you? So you remembered everything I said, right? All right, well, let's have a little quick recap. Uh, in the middle of August, go outside 9 o'clock at night. Solarium lets you set the time. Look in the west for Virgo disappearing. Arc to arc tourists from the Big Dipper's handle. Orange star, speed to spike up. Blue star, your eye tells star temperatures. Orange is cool. Blue is very hot. The sun is yellow. That means it's in the middle, average. Blue stars can be 20,000 degrees. Red stars, orange stars can be a few hundred degrees. The sun, ah, 5,000 degrees is nothing. Look in the north for five constellations. Big Bear, Little Bear, Queen, King, the line between the two, the longest constellation in the sky. Draco is a Draco. The Draco is a dragon. Look in the south for the signs of the zodiac to find the sun, the moon, the planets. They all move around in a flat plane because the solar system is pretty flat except for Mercury and Pluto, which go at weird angles. Look in the south, you'll see tonight the moon is in the way. Over the next few nights, the moon leaves the sky gradually, leaving you a nice dark sky to see Jupiter and Saturn. I urge you very strongly to come back here on a clear night and let the astronomers show you Jupiter and Saturn in a telescope. It's extraordinary. Look for Scorpius the... Scorpion. Sagittarius the... Teapot or centaur. Above it, the serpent carrier. The signs of summer coming up. Aquila the eagle with its bright star out there. There are two more bright stars in the summer that make a triangle that I'll talk about next time. You'll never guess what astronomers call this triangle in the sky. Go on. The summer triangle. Very good. We've got some. You are all very bright people. I can see that you're catching on to astronomical terminology very well. I applaud you. And then uh, later on, uh, well, this is tonight. The moon is in the way. So we don't have to worry because the clouds have ruined everything. That's a close-up on Sagittarius, the moon, Jupiter, and Saturn. All but the moon will be there next month when we see what's up in the September sky. Look for the Lagoon Nebula. That's what it looks like in a very good long exposure photo. And here's what it looks like to the Hubble Space Telescope. The picture that we saw at the beginning of my talk. Beautiful place where stars are being born. Jupiter and Saturn are extraordinary. It's, it's possible for amateur astronomers to make beautiful pictures now of the planets. This was done with a 14-inch telescope. We have telescopes here that are bigger than that. Shows incredible detail, including the biggest storm in the solar system. It's big, it's red, it looks like a spot. What do we call it? 
the big or great red spot. Thank you very much. Uh oh. Yeah, uh, uh, you didn't get up fast enough. Homework. You want to go to you watch news. Say after me, you watch news. You watch news.org, the United Astronomy Club of New Jersey has all kinds of upcoming events, references, what to see in the sky, who's coming up, who's talking, how to get here. It's great. Magazines, Sky and Telescope, Astronomy, they're still in print and they're also online. Programs and apps, there are, there's at least two dozen apps where you can hold your phone up to the sky and it'll tell you what you're looking at. Uh, Skyview is one that I use. You can get Stellarium and Celestia for either your phone or your computer. I belong to the International Association of Astronomical Artists. I'm space artist, artist, and I have my own website linked to theirs, astronomyinmotion.com. That's my wife and me by Niagara Falls, and you can learn all about me at my website. Oops. Um, quick advertisement, I have written a book with fun interactive planets you can play with and hold in your hands. With an interactive device like a phone, you can move the planets in 3D. And they solve four mysteries of astronomy. It's everywhere. It's space history mystery solved. And finally, I want to thank you all for being such a good audience. Before you go, some warnings. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to see much in the sky tonight except the moon. But I invite you to take a tour of the observatories. Let your eyes get used to the dark gradually. Walk slowly and carefully. Use our amateur astronomers as guides. They know a lot. Ask them a lot of darn fool questions. They love it because there's no such thing as a stupid question. You've been a great audience. Thank you for coming to see what's up in the sky. Thanks very much. I'm going to stick around for questions. I'm going to pull my mask up. I'll be wandering around like the rest of you, but I'm going to stay right here for a few moments to see if there are any questions. Thank you again.